Well, good morning. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Ben Niblett. I work for Tier Fund, and I've not come very far today. I come from Staines, round the M25 in Surrey. So an easy journey. And it was making me realise last time I was here, I brought my family and we went cycling in Wendover Woods. Um, and that was our first experience of electric bikes. So every time I come here, it's to do something green, you'll be pleased to hear. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the hope and the wisdom and the challenge you give us in our strange times. And we pray, Lord, that through what I say and through this beautiful exhibition here, you stimulate, you challenge, you support us, Lord, and give us your guidance. Amen. So Tear Fund is a Christian international development charity. We work in emergencies, we work in disasters, and we work in ordinary times in 50 of the world's poorest countries. And we work through the local church, and partly that's because it's who we are as Christians, but partly it's also because the church is the world's biggest network. There are churches in the remote, most remote places where no other organisation reaches. And as the church, we are one body, united internationally, uh, from the UK to Nigeria to Brazil to Ethiopia to India and anywhere else. And it was a long time ago that TFN first started noticing strange weather making it harder to make a living amongst the communities we served. And it was harder to spot in those days. So it was all the way back in 1992 that Tier Fund first started talking about climate change. And since then, it's become far more obvious and unavoidable. And we have said far more about it. So you may know we've been living through a golden age when it comes to reducing poverty. Over the last 30 years, more people have escaped from poverty than any other time in human history. We haven't seen anything like this before. But that era is ending. And in fact, a few years ago now, back in 2016, that was the first year for about 30 years where more people were hungry than the year before. Up to that point, it had been falling. 2016 was the first year where, thanks particularly to conflict and to the changing climate, the number of people in hunger started to increase again. And it has increased since. And this comes about as the climate changes there are many different impacts. And a little later on, uh, we'll see a film with some of my colleagues explaining some of them. But just quickly, we see more storms. They are stronger. And there are storms, cyclones, hurricanes happening in places where they did not used to. There are more floods. And two weeks ago, you might have seen on your TV screens that a third of Pakistan has been underwater. A third of the country. There are more floods. <laughs> and they are worse than before. It's not on the same scale, but in my street in Staines, half a mile from the River Thames, we had a flood recently for the first time in living memory. Uh, my neighbour is 65. She's lived here all her life. Our street has never flooded before, but we did. And I never thought I'd wake up one morning to see soldiers sailing dinghies down my street to rescue people from the houses at the lowest end of it, uh, which are the sheltered houses. But that's what I saw one morning, and it was a year until those people could go home again, till the insurance was sorted out and the homes were fit to live in once more. And that's in a wealthy country like the UK, where many of us have savings, insurance, an army that has dinghies. Who knew? Well, there are droughts, and again, here in the UK, earlier this year, it went above 40 degrees in England, which it just shouldn't do. That was bad enough. But more seriously, uh, in the Horn of Africa, in Ethiopia, Somalia, parts of Kenya and Uganda, there's been no rain for three years. Food supplies are exhausted. Famine is likely. Societies that did have savings, that could even perhaps have insurance in some places, that's gone. That's all been used. There's not much left there. 
anymore. And rainfall. If you're a farmer, in many, and I've heard this from so many different parts of the world, people were saying when I was little, the rains used to come at the same time each year, and we knew most years, once it started to rain, it would continue to rain, and we knew how many weeks it would rain for, and we knew when to plant, but it's different now. The rains start and they stop, or they don't come when they're meant to. I hear that again and again. I was at the Lambeth Conference, a huge gathering of Anglican bishops from around the world earlier this summer. I've never felt more Anglican. It was amazing. And I've never seen more people dressed in purple. <laughs> and amongst those hundreds of bishops, uh, I was talking to them about tier funding climate and those things. I talked to several hundred bishops, which is quite exhausting. Um, and two conversations stand out in particular. I met a bishop from South Sudan, and I was telling him about a resource tier fund has about um, the local church and disasters, how we can help communities prepare for disasters and be resilient and get through them together and then cope when disaster strikes. That was the kind of conversation I'd expected to have. And he was telling me about his diocese in South Sudan, one of the world's poorest countries, where conflict has forced him, most of his clergy, most of his people to flee across the border and they're living in the north of Uganda now. And there the environment is fragile, each tree is precious, rainfall is lacking. And he was telling me how the people nurture every last bit of green, every last bit of moisture there is in the soil, every last tree. And a few minutes later I found myself talking to a bishop from Northern California, perhaps one of the wealthiest parts of the world. But she also was interested in my resource on how the local church can cope in times of disaster, which we all call pastors in disasters. And she was telling me, to my surprise, that she also wanted this resource to take home <laughs> and give to her clergy because she said, we have come to realise in Northern California, most summers now, we will be a disaster zone. There will be heat waves, there will be droughts, there will be forest fires. People will be made homeless. Most summers from now on, that's how it's going to be. And that took me aback. But that does illustrate how we, the church, are one body, and in our strange times, we face the same challenges together. But it also illustrates the injustice of climate change, because it was not the people from South Sudan who caused it. They did almost nothing to put the emissions into the atmosphere that we now know have caused climate change. That was people like us. And before you get too guilty, it was even more people in Northern California. But it was us too. And we did it by accident before we had any idea that innocent things like when my granny would light her coal fire, which is a lovely homely smell that I still remember fondly, but all the time we now know it was warming the earth up. And we have continued to live that way since, with more knowledge. We have not cut our emissions quickly enough or hastily enough compared to the scale of the problem. So let's look at our Bible passages this morning. Some of it, I think, is a timeless truth about being a Christian, about following Jesus together, is that famous verse from Psalm 24. Verse 1, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. And everything that lives in it is made by him and belongs to him. That's a timeless part of our faith. It has always been so. And it's always been part of our job as Christians to care for that creation. Out of worship for the God who made it, who loves it, who takes delight in it. If we love him, we will love his creation too. It's one part of loving him. In the same way that if you have a family member who loves something that doesn't really appeal to you. In my family's case, that's cricket, which I'm very fond of and the rest of them are not, but they tolerate me going on about it because they love me. And in the same way, even if you are not awed by the majesty of the mountaintops, or the beauty of a red kite flying overhead, or the joy of seeing a forest break into leaf in the spring, if these things leave you cold, even then, you, you will still love them out of love for the God who you follow. 
And as Jesus summarised the whole of the Old Testament, just in those two verses he quotes, love the Lord your God with all of your heart and soul and mind and strength. That leads us to caring for creation. And in our times, loving our neighbours also leads us to caring for creation, partly because creation points to God, and the more species God made that we drive to extinction, or the more beautiful places God made that we smear with oil and plastic, the harder it becomes to see God's image. And it stops being such an effective signpost to him. But more than that, damaging our creation, damaging God's creation, damages our neighbours and all of us who depend on it to survive. So as we saw in the story of the Good Samaritan, who is our neighbour? It's everybody. It's not just people who look like us. It's not just people from our locality or our tribe. And part of the reason Jesus tells this story is to people who need to hear that God is not just a tribal deity for them and their relatives. God is a global God, a universal God for all people, all times, all of creation. So we need to care for our neighbours, even if it's not us who are responsible for things that have affected them. And the Good Samaritan in the story went across all the expectations of the time to care generously for the man who was attacked. He put his hand into his own pocket. He took time out from what he was doing. He let himself be drawn in and, gave, and put his heart into it. And we need to do the same with this changing climate that we live in. Because climate change is like those robbers on that road. The, un the injustice of it and the damage of it. As it robs people of food, first and foremost. Of water to drink. But of their livelihoods, their security, their homes. Education and health care. If your family loses its income, you can no longer afford to send your children to school, even if the school is cheap and the fees are low and the uniforms don't cost much. If you have nothing, you can't afford them. And also you need your children's labour to help you survive day to day. You can't afford to send them to school, or not all of them. And in the same way at government level, as governments are forced to spend more of their money helping rebuild infrastructure destroyed by storms, bridges washed away, as you may have seen in Pakistan, health clinics destroyed. That means governments that spend money on those things have less money to spend on paying teachers, on education, on health care, on the other things that all of us need, but the poorest of the poor need them most. So climate change is like those robbers in the story of the Good Samaritan. So how do we respond? There's a lot we can do to adapt. Let me tell you about two, two of my favourite of the many different things that Tear Fund and agencies like us do, working with local churches, helping people cope and change. So one is farming differently, conservation farming, to preserve water in the soil, to stop it running away when it does rain, to catch it and persuade it to stay and linger and go deeper. Drought-resistant crops, salt-resistant crops, if you're near the coast and the sea level is rising. New techniques, new crops, new inputs to help farmers escape from having to buy expensive fertilisers and use mulch and other techniques instead. And small loans. Or replacing expensive kerosene lights to light your home at night that you have to buy each week and that's dangerous, easily knocked over, prone to causing fires and definitely causing smoke that makes people cough and causes, and causes lung diseases. Solar lanterns, once you've got it, the sunshine is free, you have light of an evening. You can study, you can run a business in the evening, it's safer to go outside where there are lights. It's an amazing change bringing electricity to places where no electricity grid will ever be needed. They can skip that altogether. There are things we can do. 
Governments can do more. Churches can do more. But beyond that, beyond the level of what we can do for ourselves as communities, we need to speak out. And I'd like to show you a film explaining some of that now. For millions of people across the world, the changing climate means empty stomachs, lost livelihoods and homes swept away. It's time for world leaders to deliver on their promises to address this. My name is Promise Salau. I work with TF1 Nigeria. In the northern part, we're experiencing drought, we're experiencing heat waves. Many, many farmers are unable to farm anymore, leading to increase in poverty. In the south, south, we're experiencing rainfalls, flooding. People are losing livelihoods and their homes. And this makes me feel very, very sad. And as extreme weather events increase, many nations are being forced to divert money away from essential public services, such as healthcare and schooling, to protect themselves against the impacts of the climate crisis, a crisis they didn't cause. This is a huge injustice. Back in 2009, wealthier nations promised to provide $100 billion a year from 2020 to help communities adapt to the impacts of climate change. But this promise has still not been met. During the Climate Summit in Glasgow, we had hoped that the $100 billion um, promised by wealthy countries in 2009 would be fulfilled. Unfortunately, this was not done. Unless the financial burden is lifted by the commitment of these wealthy countries, countries like Nigeria will continue to suffer the consequences. While they wait for the money that's been promised, communities that are bearing the brunt of the climate crisis are doing all they can, from solar-powered wells to sustainable farming practices, to adapt and to address the impacts of the crisis. I'm Seth Yashingado. I've worked in over 70 agrarian communities in North Central Nigeria, and they have been affected by the impact of climate change. You see that a lot in land degradation. You also see that in droughts, which, are, which is known in the north, northern part of the country, but it's creeping in gradually to the central part of Nigeria. We've tried to make farmers embrace climate smart agriculture with, to solve this food insecurity problem in the country, and also save lives and livelihoods. So much more needs to be done across Nigeria and in Africa as a whole. Climate vulnerable nations like Nigeria need investments so they can innovate and adapt to the impacts of the climate crisis. This year, the UK government has said it will use its position as COP president until November to influence wealthy nations to deliver the money they've promised and to ensure it reaches the communities that need it. Together, let's call on the UK government to deliver on its promises. Will you join us? Will you join us? Will you join us? Will you join us? Add your voice to our petition today. Thank you. So there was a great promise made and a successful campaign to get the promise all the way back in 2009 that every year from 2020 to 2025, the world's richest governments, including the UK, would make this big transfer of money to help poor countries adapt to climate change and find their own clean ways to develop. So what I'd like to ask you is, as you leave, please could you take one of these Time to Deliver postcards? Could you open it up? And could you fill in this part and add your name and address there? And we will send this message to our new Prime Minister. She's got quite a big in-tray already, hasn't she? We want to add this to it and make sure it doesn't go overlooked by her and her government. Uh, so we're handing in the petition shortly. And as you heard, the UK is still the host, the president of the climate talks that, that were held here in Glasgow last year. Uh, we pass on the baton to Egypt at the end of October. So before then, we've got the chance for the UK to lead getting progress on this promise, paying that money. That promise has not been met, but it's more than halfway to being met. Some money has been found, it is making a difference. But it's just wrong that the world's poorest are being shortchanged. So please do tear this off, fill it in. If you tick that box there underneath your name and address, I will leave you in peace. But if you don't tick it, I would love to send you more cards like this in the future. When you filled it in, please leave it in my 
basket on the table at the back, and we'll see if we get more from this congregation than we did at the nine o'clock. Who will the winner be? Um, on the rest of the card, there are, there's a reminder to prayer and a request to give, if you feel led to. There are a few other things that we can do to respond as a church. It's very urgent that we do. We have only a very few years left where it's still possible to limit the amount of warming to the relatively safe level that we can relatively well cope with, of limiting warming to 1.5 degrees from Victorian times to now, or to the end of the century. Um, by 2030, that window of opportunity will be gone. So cutting our emissions individually, as a country, as a world, quickly over the next five or six years are absolutely crucial. So within that, I was delighted when the Lambeth Conference, the Anglican Communion Worldwide, made a really good statement covering all of these issues, creation care, climate change, and pledging the church to work towards them. That was powerful. And it was even more wonderful to see how, amongst what was sometimes a disunited Anglican Communion at that conference, this was something everybody across the world, all geographies, all strands of the church, all agreed with. That was encouraging. The Church of England has set a target of reaching net zero by 2030. That is encouraging. That is a great example for us to set. The UK's target is net zero by 2050. How wonderful the church should be ahead of society and should have something to say in the public square like this. So together, let's continue to speak up Let's pray for our new Prime Minister and the government because they need it. And let's do what we can in our own lifestyles. There are many things to do. My 30 second summary is, please eat less meat, especially beef. Who would have thought we lived in a change where Jesus would care so much about burping cows? But they, these are the strange times we live in. Please fly less. If you're in the market for a new car, please make it one with a plug. And if you have the resources to insulate your house better, this would be a wonderful time to do that. If you have the resources in the situation where you can replace an oil or gas boiler with a heat, an electric heat pump, please consider doing that. There are many more things. I'll be at the back if you want to ask me for more tips. Those are my top ones. But together as the church, there are two particular things we need to bring to the party. And one is to pray for people hit by the climate crisis, for governments to keep their promises on it, and for ourselves to keep going, to set an example, as you are doing with this wonderful exhibition. Eco-church, something else we can do. Nearly 2,000 churches have eco-church awards, addressing caring for creation in every part of church life. And it's wonderful to see your award celebrated in your porch as I came in. But I think the most important thing we offer as the church is hope. It's easy to feel overwhelmed, it's easy to be tempted to despair, but as the church we know we serve a God who can do more than we can think or ask or imagine. And we also know that we're not in this alone. God is not relying just on me or just on you. He has something like two billion Christians in the world. So we're all in this together. Take hope in that and encourage each other. Thank you. Right, first I'm going to read Bands of Marriage and then I won't forget to do that. I published the Bands of Marriage between Renato uh, Macolo Passaro and Rebecca Louise Varvel, both of the parish of St Mary the Virgin, Western Turville, um, to be married here on the 15th of October. So please, can you be keeping Renato and Rebecca in your prayers as they pray, prepare um, for your, their wedding very soon. So, um, Ben talked about this card, Time to Deliver. Please make sure you pick one up and uh, do the appropriate tearing off um, of the postcard and filling it in. Um, Next Sunday is Harvest. Um, this service will be uh, one 
that doesn't have communion. It's going to be led by Nadine and Becky, and I know it'll be great fun. Um, it's the first Sunday of the month, so we're asking for our usual Chilton food bank donations. But please give as generously as you can, because I know shelves are getting very empty. But there's also a chance to either give financially to the food bank, which means that they can top up where they need to, or to the um, Disaster Emergency Committee, um, raising money for Pakistan. Ben mentioned the flooding there. So take an envelope um, and put some money in it um, for next week, and if you can gift aid, to be filling that in as well. And finally, um, as Ben said, we have our Bronze Award for Eco Church, um, but we continue, want to continue that work. It's a very, very small group of people that are doing that. And so an encouragement um, for you to take one of these cards, pray and think how you can get involved, fill it in and bring it back to us. At four o'clock this afternoon, there is a concert um, by some young people from the village um, that's uh, raising money for uni UNICEF, is that right? right. It is, it's for Ukraine, yes, sorry. I'm, I'm trying to remember lots and lots of things. Um, so please come to that, uh, if you can, at four o'clock this afternoon. And to stop there. Mm -hmm.